So now that we've had some thoughts about symmetry and we've also taken a look at electric flux, we are now on our way to uh, developing Gauss's law. Now, fair disclaimer here, I'm not going to make sure that absolutely every I is dotted and every T is crossed. Um, I assure you that the the full argument is rigorous. I'm just trying to give you a flavor for how the argument works. So we'll start by imagining putting a, um, actually let's put it right here. Let's imagine we have a charge plus Q right here. And let's go ahead and put a spherical Gaussian surface centered around our charge like so and keep in mind this Gaussian surface here only exists in our mind we can make it any radius we like um, in this case here I'm going to just say it's radius R okay what I want to know is what is the flux through the Gaussian surface in terms of this charge right here. Well, we can play the same game. Since this point charge has spherical symmetry, this is why I chose the sphere. Everywhere you look, the electric field vector is going to point straight out. Oops, E. And also everywhere you look, the differential area vector, DA, will also be pointing straight out. So the angle between the two of these is zero. And this is true literally everywhere on the surface of the sphere. So we can go ahead and follow our same recipe as before of saying that the electric flux is equal to the integral of E dotted with dA. So this will be the integral of E dA and everywhere we are, the angle will be zero, so cosine of zero, which is one. E is a constant, so we can pull it out of the integral. It's a constant because we're the same distance away everywhere, right? So this will be E times the integral dA, which is the surface area of a sphere. So this will be E times four pi r squared. But I want this in terms of Q, so I'm going to have to put in what the electric field is a distance r away. Remember that an elect the electric field strength is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q over r squared, and that will be times by 4 pi r squared. Cancel, 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 and we are left with the electric flux for our single point charge in um, centered inside our Gaussian surface being equal to Q over epsilon naught. Now this is not yet Gauss's law, but we are already a good chunk of the way there. So now what Gauss did was to extend this. He started thinking, yeah, that's great, but what if my Gaussian surface isn't so beautiful? Um, let's say my Gaussian surface, and here I'm just going to be drawing in cross-section. Let's say it's more egg-shaped. So I'm trying, yeah, I wanted an egg. There we go. So let's say we've got an egg-shaped Gaussian surface here. What can we pull out of it? Well, the first thing we can get out of this is if we look back here, we notice that there was no dependence on the radius. And that makes a lot of sense, because remember, the electric flux counts the electric field, number of electric field lines. No matter how far away I am, there are only, if I'm surrounding all, the, if all the electric field lines have to pass through my surface. So it's always gonna be the same number. So Gauss took that clue. And what he argued was that instead of thinking, trying to handle that egg shape directly where the values of E um, would be constantly changing 
and the val and the direction of DA would be constantly changing, and E and DA wouldn't necessarily be pointed in any clean directions. What he realized you could do, and mathematicians make this rigorous, but I'm just going to kind of wave my hands about it a bit, is he imagined that what you could do is you could make something that's roughly an egg with using spherical shell pieces combined with chunks of planes that pass through the charge. And you kind of zigzag this all around like so. Okay, I'm not the best artist on this, sorry. Ah, like that. Okay, something like that. I, I did it badly, but uh, not too badly, actually. Just this last bit needs to do something like that. There we go. And so the deal with these spherical shell pieces here is that we know that they don't depend on the radius. So then the next step in this process is we can imagine, you know, it's the same number of field lines by the symmetry of the thing have to go through it, right? I mean, one, two, three, four, like that. If I bring it in closer, it'll still be one, two, three, four. They'll be spaced closer together, but we're closer up. So it's the same number going through. So the, And with these planes, the number of field lines going through the planes is always zero by construction because we made the electric field lines pass tangent to the plane. So the flux is zero here. And here, the flux does not depend on R. So then what we can do is we can kind of imagine sliding, without any loss of generality, what we can do is we can imagine sliding these planes together until we've made a sphere or sorry, these shells together until we've made a sphere. And we've already done the sphere. So for the crazy zigzaggy thing that we just did, we still have that the electric flux is equal to Q over epsilon naught because it's still the same number of electric field lines passing through everywhere. If we draw them in just to make that more explicit we can see that regardless of whether it's the green, the purple, or the orange, I have the same number of electric field lines passing through each wedge. But, you argue, this crazy zigzaggy thing doesn't look anything like an egg, and I'll agree with you there. But the idea is you can again go to taking a differential limit of this. So you look at smaller and smaller and smaller shell pieces with smaller and smaller planes, and eventually it all zigzags down until it basically will look exactly like the egg. And mathematicians have proven rigorously that this is legit. Okay. But it did occur to Gauss that you also have to think about what if you have a charge outside the Gaussian surface. So again, we'll assume a positive charge just to think about it. And so then I'll have just some sort of arbitrary Gaussian surface like that. And what we'll do is we'll play the exact same game where we'll turn it into something that looks like, oops, like this, where we've got two spherical shells there and there. 
in two planes that slice through the charge here and here. And you should be able to convince yourself that everywhere we look, if I draw the electric field lines that are leaving my charge and going through either of these surfaces, you can see that whatever goes in goes out. So this is like in the previous video where we had the box with the number of lines that go in and go out. Um, so we know this is going to equal zero. And we already know that for the planes here, the flux equals zero here and here. And here we know that the flux is equal to something. But whatever it is there, see here we have, here we've got E pointing this way and DA always pointing the same way. So an angle of zero degrees. Here we have E pointing this way and DA pointing anti-parallel. So here the angle, sorry, is 180 degrees. So that means that for this surface here, the flux, the electric flux, is going to be equal to negative something. So whatever it was exiting the, sh the outer shell, you had the negative for the inner shell. So if for any charge that's outside of our Gaussian surface, if we have a charge, if we have a Gaussian surface and the charge we care about is outside, the electric flux in this case is zero. And it does not matter how close to our Gaussian surface the charge is. If it's outside, it's outside and the flux is zero. But remember what that just means is the number of lines going in equals the number of lines going out. It could be an awful lot of lines, but the number in equals the number out. So finally, we get to the general case. So let's say we've got a whole bunch of charges I'm just drawing a whole bunch of charges here. And it doesn't matter if they're positive or negative. Um, and so I'll go ahead and draw my Gaussian surface. And let's say it's just some arbitrary surface that looks like that. Alrighty, so we can go ahead and now let's for sake of argument, let's number these. We'll say this is charge one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right. So we can start with the same recipe we've always had. The electric flux is equal to integral E dot dA. And at first blush, you might be thinking, oh my gosh, that electric field is going to be horrendous. And you're right, it is. And trying to directly do this integral would be awful. But thanks to superposition, we can say the electric field at any point will be the electric field due to charge one, plus the electric field due to charge two, plus and so forth, dotted with dA. Now, the dot product distributes, so this becomes the integral of E1 dotted with dA plus the integral of E2 dotted with, um, sorry, plus E2 dot dA plus and such. And integration distributes as well. In this case, it, it meets the conditions to do it. So this will be integral E1 dot dA plus the integral E2 dot, oops, dot dA plus and such. But we know how to evaluate these. This is going to be equal to Q1 over epsilon naught 
because it's inside the Gaussian surface, just barely, but it counts. Plus Q2 over epsilon naught, plus and such up to Q4 in this case, over epsilon naught. And then for Q5 and on out to 10, um, they're all zeros because they're outside. All right, so putting this all back together, we get that the electric flux is equal to, well, we can pull out an epsilon naught everywhere. This is Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3 and so forth. These are just the charges inside the surface. So we'll call that Q sub n for charge inside. And then finally, we can write Gauss's law, which says that the electric flux through any Gaussian surface is equal to the total charge inside over epsilon naught. Now, a few notes here. Um, we derived this from Coulomb's law, but in a more advanced treatment, um, this is actually more general than Coulomb's law. I'm just asserting that that's true. So, historically, Gauss's law was obtained this way. Eventually, physicists realized that this was the more general thing. Um, this is because Gauss's law is valid for moving charges. Coulomb's law is not. Although it's usually okay. if they're going slow. And by slow, I mean slow compared to the speed of light. So I could still be moving on to you and me. Um, and the other note to make here is that Gauss's law um, can only really be used to find electric fields, practically speaking, if the fields are highly symmetric. When you do have, so this is why, it, it, this is one of those weird things um, for presenting. So for practical purposes, most of the time, if you need to find an electric field, you are going to just plain have to set up all the charges in the problem, calculate all the contributions and add them up. But every so often, you'll have something where the situation is highly symmetric. And if it is highly symmetric, then we'll see in future videos that we can use Gauss's law to cut through those problems like a hot chainsaw through butter. So it isn't useful for a lot of things, but for what it is useful for, oh boy, is it useful. And so with that, we'll catch you in the next series of videos. Have a good one.